Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today on this very sunny Friday afternoon. I'm Emily and I'm the content manager here at Birdie. I'll be your host for this webinar. And as you can see, I am also joined by Mark Walsh, who is the founder of COVID Calm and the director and co-lead trainer of the Embodied Facilitator course, amongst many other accolades that I'll let him explain in just a minute, once that everyone has had a chance to join us. Now, I can see that people are trickling in. We are just bang on the hour, so I will give it just a couple of minutes before we launch into the questions. But if you can hear me okay, uh, just let me know by popping a note into the chat box. It's just to the right of your screen. Um, you can put an emoji, just put a hello, whatever you like, just so I know you can hear me. Uh, and if you have any sound issues during this session, pop a note straight into that chat box because we do have some of the team uh, from Birdie who are on hand and they will give you uh, any help you need if you can't hear us or if you get stuck or if anything happens. Cool. Now, I can see you all know where the chat box is. That's great. I was just about to uh, just say if you have any questions, we can't hear you. You're all on mute. Um, but if you do have questions as we go along, pop those into the chat box. Um, and if we can get to them during the session, we will. If not, we do have a little bit of time afterwards for a QA. and a now I'm just going to give this just a couple more minutes while everyone trickles in and I will just outline uh, very, very briefly what to expect from today's session. So some of you might have joined me for a webinar before and if you have, welcome back. Um, but if you haven't, this is kind of what we're going to go through today. Now, let me just double check. No, sorry, it is working. Sorry, I thought it wasn't working. That was my screen has frozen. <laughs> but it's fine as long as it's all good on your end. Right. Fab. Cool. So what to expect from today? Now, at Birdie, we want to help home care agencies to succeed and, you know, be the best they can be. Now, we don't offer any mental health services, but we know that this is a topic that's been talked a lot about during the COVID-19 crisis. Now, for key workers, for NHS staff, for those, you know, on the front line, they've been far greater exposed to this crisis than any of us have. And I think, you know, the call for the mental health and looking after mental health well-being is much greater for those staff. So that's what we wanted to talk about today. Now, at Birdie, we don't have the answers. Like I said, we don't do anything to do with mental health. But that's why we've invited Mark to speak with us today. And he is going to be sharing uh, his tips on mental health and some of the theories behind the principles that he uses. And as I said before, um, he's an expert in this field, so please do ask him your questions as we go along, and we'll try and get to those either during the session or at the end of the session. Cool. So, now we are a few minutes in, and there's quite a lot of information on screen there about Mark, but I'm going to let him um, introduce himself and tell you a little bit about what he does. So, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, please can you just give us an intro and let everyone know about what you do? Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so I help people not go crazy. That is the short version. Okay. <laughs> so why? I come from a family of crazy people. I, uh, you, you know, if I use non-politically correct language, it's just I like to speak in down-to-earth terms. That's how my mom would talk about it. And uh, there's plenty of mental health issues in our family. I've been around a lot of humanitarian workers when I worked in war zones. Um, my own background is psychology, but also the martial arts, meditation, and mindfulness, yoga more kind of alternative things as well I've found very helpful over the years and I've developed a specialism in working with what's called embodiment which just means mind body psychology I'm sure people have heard of mindfulness so it's an extension of that really and I've developed this specialism in helping people not go nuts so I've worked with all kinds of people in very extreme situations so when COVID kicked off I was like well this is just daily bread for me you know talking <laughs> to my colleague we were both in Afghanistan together and I was like this is just a Tuesday. Why is everyone panicking, you know? So now um, we, we've decided to just to get practical and help people in practical ways. So that's what I do. That's great. Thank you for that. Cool. So the first question I have for you then, just to launch right on into it, is what is mental health, essentially? You know, how do you understand it? Um, how should everyone else understand it? And why is it so important to take care of it? Yeah, I mean, people could spend right books on what is and isn't mental health. I think back in the day, Freud said it was the ability to work and love. So what I liked about that is it's like saying, you know, our, is our mental state in a position where we can work, be productive, but also where we can have intimate relationships, you know, look after our kids, family, all the rest of it. So I, I think that second part is important, too. And I think we could talk about it from a level of pathology. Like it's not just 
you could look at mental health just like an absence of mental health illnesses, like, I don't know, post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety mm -hmm. disorder. Um, or we could look at it as thriving. So what would be the mental state needing for us to thrive, given the conditions we're in, which for different people are different. And I think it does need to be situated as a biological thing. You know, your mental health is not independent from your physical health. If you've ever missed a night's sleep, you'll be quite aware of that. Um, your uh, psychology is, of course, important. Also, your sociology, your, you know, your relationships, your environment that you're in, if you're living in poverty, if you've got noisy neighbours, if you've got a baby that's keeping you up all night. I mean, these things are all part of it. So I think we should always look at it within the context we're in, because uh, it's very different if I'm, you know, teaching in a yoga studio than if I'm teaching soldiers in a war zone, you know, <laughs> it's just a very different vibe and very different context. So I think we should always look at it in context. No, of course, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, what you just said there, it's uh, it's more than just this idea of, you know, an illness or something that's going on at the time. Your mental health kind of affects every single aspect of, of your day-to-day -day life, essentially, and it can be impacted from physical factors, you know, as well as things going on. So that's a really, really useful, a useful point there. And something that I think when we've mentioned mental health before, you know, people have said, oh, I, I don't have an illness, I'm fine, or, you know, things are going well. So a really a really nice summary there, so thank you for that one. Now, the next question I have for you is, again, this could be answered in an entire book, but uh, <laughs> what risk to our mental health does COVID-19 bring? Okay, well, I'm, I'm not sort of, you know, I'm a doctor, so I'm not going to give any medical mm -hmm. advice, obviously, um, but it's, I'm not going to talk about the illness directly. However, I think the main one for many people working around it is just stress. Now, I say just stress, but stress is actually impacting all our mental health issues. And these could be anything from disease just to a un bit of unhappiness, you know. Um, burnout, obviously, professionally, more longer term aspect of stress, right up to people who are getting PTSD from really being on the front lines and making, you know, ter you know really difficult decisions like reverse triage decisions. I've talked to some doctors about it's really rough, you know, who's going to be taken off a ventilator or something. And for many people, it's just background anxiety. The fact that we've all become scared to breathe, we've become scared to go near other human beings and we're social animals. So that's kind of it's pretty tricky. You know, you've got that physical reaction in your body when someone gets too near you in the shop or the park or whatever. Um, so I'm seeing across the broad board, I'm seeing a whole range. There was also a kind of a grief curve that happened with COVID, uh, which is this kind of like stages of grief. And a lot of people went into a kind of fight or flight response initially, mm -hmm. and then they got exhausted and went into a kind of collapse. And then there was a sort of new normal equilibrium established. And as, as lockdown ends, we'll also see another curve around people's behavior and emotions around that. So I think we need to look at, you know, what risk, well, who, when, where. But if I was to answer it in one word, I'd just say stress. I think, yeah, we've been hearing stress a lot and in so many different forms. And um, it's nice you said about, you know, we've had these different stages as well during COVID-19. I mean, when it first kicked off, it was a completely different sense of stress to kind of where we are now. Um, and I think being able to deal with your mental health the whole way through is is the key to making sure that we can we can deal with this stress that we're getting um, constantly. So, yeah, definitely a lot of risk that we have from COVID-19, but hopefully we can talk about some ways to manage those throughout this webinar, which would be great. So thank you for that one. Now, I have a few questions here um, about COVID calm and kind of what you were doing in that space. Now, if some people might not know what that was, so would you mind just telling us a bit about COVID, COVID calm and why did you set it up? Yeah, well, the first thing I set up was groups for non-medical personnel, uh, just so people could connect who were a bit isolated and lonely online. We had these Zoom rooms and we added sort of little stress techniques to those because people were stressed. Mm -hmm. We do a little breathing technique, something we'd call centering or a little mindfulness technique or some very gentle movement work, you know, all really accessible stuff because mm -hmm. we didn't want to alienate people who had, you know, physical issues or didn't want it to be too hippie, you know. Uh, so we did that for normal people. Then someone said, hey, you should really offer this to doctors and nurses and mm -hmm. other healthcare professionals. And, um, yeah, we thought, why not? So I've got a pretty good network of trainers. I put an email out, got 100 responses, had a couple of people volunteer to admin it. Within a week, we were offering sessions, you know, just around the clock. And um, we decided that rather than try and be therapists, some of us were therapists, some of us like me weren't, better that we give people tools. Because uh, tools is like the old teacher person to fish thing. You know, you give someone a... I can I could guide you through something now, but if you learned it, you could take it away and use it. It's way more useful. And the other piece to it is peer support. 
So we do the beauty of Zoom is you can make these breakout rooms and you can have, you know, you've probably used it by now. You can have 10 doctors from around the world and then the press apart and they're in groups of three. And then there's a doctor in Canada talking to a doctor in England and they'd say, yeah, you know, they'd share experiences. And and you, with that, with peer support, you don't get the old, you wouldn't understand, you know? Yeah. And, and people are much more likely to open up to peers who they're not directly professionally connected to. You know, you don't necessarily want to tell your boss everything. Um, and people will talk to each other. People feel relaxed about each other. So they're the two elements. We just had these five tools that were sort of very um, evidence-based because doctors like concrete evidence-based stuff. Mm -hmm really quick wins because people will don't we, we were doing half hour sessions and even that was too long for some you know they just come for 10 minutes on a break you know and um yeah we've cut down a little bit now as the demand has kind of dipped a little bit um but that that's been a successful little program basically that's cool and the reason you know the reason we asked you to join us here was because we found out about covid calm and we saw it on the internet and we thought wow this is great and then you know, I had a look at the test sessions and saw what you were running and I thought this is just so good to be able to teach these people, you know, some, some tools that they need, some techniques to manage, you know, their mental health and kind of get them grounded again. But also, like you said, it was that element of peer support and that is kind of what's been missing throughout COVID-19. You know, we've had this distance and it's been quite difficult to deal with. Now, of course, uh, NHS staff and frontline workers are, are seeing people every day, but there's still that distance. They might not be able to see their family or you know, their friends. So I think it was also like, it was multi-level. And that's what we really liked at Birdie. And it's sort of, you know, it was that idea of let's, we're, let's all do this together and let's learn from each other so that we can continue on. Now, one thing uh, when I was watching your test session was uh, you were talking about this idea of psychological PPE. Yeah. I absolutely love this idea. So I would love it if you could just explain for our listeners what psychological PPE is, because I mean, it kind of makes sense when you break it down, you look at it, but you know, it sounds like a, a wild idea. So yeah, really, we were just looking at a way of explaining resilience, training, psychological mm -hmm. well-being, preparation to uh, uh, healthcare professionals. And I was talking to a few doctors and nurses about it. I had a little focus group of doctors and nurses on my WhatsApp and I'd call them and I'd message them and say, what do you think of this? What should we call this? What should we call that? And they'd be like, don't call it that. Ah, that's rubbish. Or no one will understand that. And, uh, and at one point I said, well, is it, it's sort of like, you know, everyone was talking about PPE, the personal protective equipment. There was this worry the NHS wouldn't have enough gloves or masks, you know, and in some places it was pretty serious worry. In other places it proved not to be true, but it was um, an issue at the time. It was on people's minds. And, and everybody knows that with a virus, you put on gloves you put on a mask and you're less likely to catch it right it doesn't make it you know a guarantee but it's a it's a safety precaution mm -hmm. and no one would would go into you know to, no doctor would treat someone with covid if without their ppe that's crazy right so we said okay well this is the same psychologically you're going into a high stress environment better to have some preparation these things uh, tools will show you uh, will um, keep you more psychologically safe. They'll keep you more psychologically well to prepare yourself for what's coming. And, um, you know, this is how I've got through many difficult things in life. And, um, yeah, sometimes it's just office stress for me. But I'm a manager. I run a little company and I've got employees. And, you know, we had a venue cancel on us today. And, you know, I had a thing that didn't do well on sales yesterday on an email we sent out. And that's just normal. So it's like, this is life right you know we had the water go off yesterday because it was dripping on the neighbor down the stairs the neighbor came up angry and said oh you're flooding my house I'm like, oh sorry it turns out the tap was dripping in the um in the cupboard you know this is just life so you better have some tools to deal with it and um, when things get really tough you you really better add, add that that preparation yeah i absolutely love that idea and when i came across it i just thought the exact same you know for for our nurses, for our care staff, they're out there putting on their masks, putting on their gloves. Why are they not putting on some form of, you know, psychological PPE, something that can help them deal with it? And if we think about it as something like PPE, you know, mental health protective equipment, essentially, then it just becomes another tool. It's another tool in their country. No big deal. Don't have to be esoteric. You don't have to tell me about your mother. You don't have to you know, chant arm or whatever. I mean, you can do all that if you like, right? But most people don't want to do Like, I work with police, soldiers. I work with all sorts of people. They don't want to do that stuff. They're like, just give me something I can use. Give me something practical. And that's what we did. We just got together. You know, I talked to all these different trainers. And for, for a few days, we just went, right, what is the best stuff we've got? And we went through all these possibilities. And some were too weird. Some took too long. And then we eventually went, all right, these five things we can do really easily. So that kind of leads me on to my next question here. Um, 
can you just explain, you know, what makes up psychological PPM? You haven't got to go into complete depth about each step, but, you know, just kind of walk us through what that looks like. Yeah, so we chose five tools that the criteria were they had to be effective, they had to be quick, and they had to be not too weird. Oh, fourth criteria had the evidence based as well. So there was, even though you can know yoga works, right, but it isn't necessarily an evidence based on everything within it. So um, this is where our criteria, especially dealing with skeptical, busy people, that they had to meet those criteria. Uh, so, for example, just simple things like thankfulness, like practicing gratitude, a strong evidence base for that, really easy to do. I guarantee it, if right now you spend just one or two minutes making a list of all the things in your life you're grateful for, if you tell someone else that, even better, you will feel better. You do not have to believe a word I say, test that. And that that's our general approach is to say, give this a go. So that was one, you know, mindfulness techniques, mindfulness of breathing, little, yeah, even just, a, we're not gonna do a whole yoga class, but even just get people like stretching and moving and tapping their body a little bit, people go, oh, I feel better already, you know? Um, so just simple stuff like that that we found very helpful. And then listening, getting people listening to each other, power of empathy, power of listening, simple thing, you know, and um, all in small doses. Just like the, the mindfulness, we just do like three minutes, five minutes, you know, small doses, busy people. That's, 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 it's enough to take the edge off. It's enough to just take a moment and go, right, breathe. You know, even if you just do three breaths together. Yeah. That's something we do, for example. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Three breaths is a hell of a lot better than none. <laughs> Definitely. I think sometimes there can be this kind of idea that mindfulness or yoga is going to be your hippie and you're going to have to dedicate absolutely hours to doing it. And really, like what you just said, you know, just if everyone who's listening right now goes away after this webinar and writes down five things they're grateful for, they're going to feel better. If they get up from their desk and recite them while they're walking around, you're going to feel better. It's just a way of bringing yourself back to yourself, I suppose. Yeah, because, you know, the way it works with, with this sort of psychology is that mostly what we get stressed about is either memories from the past or anxieties in the future, right? And this is why animals aren't that stressed. Like, if you're an antelope, you just sit around eating grass. Even though lions might come and eat you alive at any moment, right? You're still pretty chill because the antelope's not worrying about lions. It's just eating the grass. As a lion comes along, it worries and it runs off, but then it's fine again afterwards. Human beings, we have this capacity to ruminate, to go round and round in our head with things. And so coming back to the present moment, little things, you know, body and mind are connected. If you're in a chair all day long, if you're stressed all day long, physically, you're tight in your body, you know, even just doing a few shoulder rolls, you know, a few little stretches and twists at your desk without doing much. So, you know, within 30 seconds, a minute, people go, I feel better. And it's like, yeah, it's not magic. Yeah. <laughs> a great tip as well. So after this webinar, write down what you're grateful for and have a bit of a stretch and have a walk around and we, you'll feel better already. <laughs> I, I drink a lot of water when I'm at work. This is actually cherry juice because I have gout because I'm an old man apparently. But um, yeah, so I drink lots of water all day long. Then you have to keep getting up and going to the toilet, which means that you're moving and you're not staying still all day. So if you've got a desk job, that's my recommendation. Drink lots of water. So drink loads of water so you have to get up all the time. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I'll be using that in future. <laughs> it's important, but let us take the water, right? You can drink, taste, pay attention, and notice the sensations as the cold water goes down your throat. And then take a breath. That took less than 10 seconds. Yeah. Right? I know you're busy. I'm busy. We're all busy. But you got 10 seconds. Yeah. Right? Particularly if it's 10 seconds, that means you won't mess something up and have to do another hour on it. So, um, little things like that and that's just such a good tip as well such an easy thing to implement you know even if you did that just once a day at the end of the day yeah i would recommend doing even like the, the 30 second little breaks like that you could do that five times a day a really easy way to do that is um the ancient yogic iphone and um you know iphones have this great feature where you can set alarms you know like five of them so you just set five little alarms that takes what no more than a minute you can even set them at times when you know you know you know you're not gonna be in a meeting or something you do that in the morning, they go off. Every time one goes off, you just pause, close your eyes, take a breath. Maybe you stand up if you've been sitting down, have a quick stretch. You know, whatever 30 second thing you want to do. At 30 seconds, five times a day, that's two and a half minutes a day. Really? Come on, smokers get a three minute break every time they have a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And if you haven't got two and a half minutes in your day, I mean, this is the key, isn't it? To, to making sure that you can sort of deal with everything that's going on and two and a half minutes a day is nothing. So. 
it Everyone. is really about priorities as well. Like everybody's got two and a half minutes. Everybody's got an hour. The tricky thing is what are you prioritizing? So there is, this is the slightly deeper part to it is that self care is something that we need to prioritize. Many people who work in helping professions, so that's humanitarian workers, nurses, probably social workers too, have a little bit of a hero complex of helping other people. And that means they often mistreat themselves. And obviously that's a false economy because you can't help anyone else unless you put your own oxygen mask on first, you know. Um, the better you are, the better you can help other people. But but also there's a sort of denial of one's own vulnerability in that. That's the slightly deeper psychology of working with caring professionals. I think that's a really good point to make and one that probably a lot of people on this, this call today are familiar with but perhaps don't want to admit. So... Is that true, people that are out there? You can maybe you can say in the chat. Is that true for people in this profession? I don't know as many people in your profession as you do, so it'd be nice to get some interaction. Yeah. Give me a yes or a no if that's true. I mean, I do feel from our side at Birdie, you know, we work with a lot of care managers, and it's difficult to to sort of get them to prioritise their own self care when they're so busy, and especially in the middle of this crisis. You know, they're not just caring for um, the people that they're looking after. You know, they're caring for their carers as well. Right pain of care and it's like yeah. well you have to go five steps back to look after yourself and i think that's very very difficult to do when you know you're caring for others yeah for sure and and again this is a choice right so a reminding yourself of the false economy you can't care for anyone else unless you're caring for yourself um but also that you're modeling it so if you're teaching other people self-care and you're not self-caring I don't know if you've worked with kids at all i worked with about fifty thousand kids i worked out the other day kids ignore everything you say and they copy everything you do, okay? So it's the exact same thing with employees, with colleagues. You could be telling them about self-care, but if you're abusing yourself, that's what they see. That's what they copy, particularly if they like and respect you, right? They think, well, that must be a good thing to do. So is that really what you want to be modeling is the other thing I would, um, thank you, Gemma, for your comment. That's the other thing I would um, uh, uh, question, right, with people. And and this is maybe, they say, the harder part. If particularly people's whole identity comes from helping others, then it, it really does take a shift to learn to help oneself and to, to, to see it as an act of kindness and an act of sanity and really also just an act of efficiency. Like yeah. you're gonna get diminishing returns if you don't look after yourself. I totally see that. And that's, that's really interesting actually to mention that kind of modeling idea. You know, if you're a care manager and you've got a team beneath you, if they don't see you looking after yourself, then they're less likely to look after you themselves. And then we come back to that whole idea of productivity and how that goes in with your mental health. And I think it's just, it's a huge chain and it all starts with you. For sure, for sure. Yeah, that's where it begins, right? Like we are being the change you want to see in others. But uh, yeah, this as it must sound a bit abstract, but I, I would also just say, try the practical tools, see if you like them, see if they help the things you care about. So ultimately, you know, for me, mental health is about those things. It's about about the it is productivity. The we is does it help your relationship? And the I is does it feel good? And, you know, if, if it meets those criteria, then hell, keep doing it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Perfect. I think that some really useful tips there. And I think, yeah, if everyone just goes and takes that away, if you just take one thing, take that <laughs> from today's session. Um, but the next question I have for you, Mark, is, oh, have I gone too far? There we go. Okay. So... If something changes in your mental health, you know, if you're stressed or whatever, um, what symptoms do you need to look for? And we are talking to care managers and those in the caring profession. So it's kind of a, a two prong question. Sure. How do you recognize that as well? How to recognize it in self and others. Yeah. yeah. OK, so we're looking at signs and symptoms of approaching burnout. So, you know, we all get stressed. That's normal. Stress goes up and down. You actually wouldn't want a stress-free life. It'd be very boring, wouldn't it, if you were just sitting in a crowd all day? You know, it'd be rubbish. You know, if I if I ever end up in heaven, I'm sure there'll be some activities and stresses as well, not just some flat line. So, um, yeah, so stress is normal, but it's how we handle it. The fact that mm -hmm. it, it's okay if you have some stress, as long as you have some places to de-stress, right? As long as it's not incessant. There's, for example, there are some studies on soldiers, and World War One was particularly harsh for soldiers because it was just like you're in the trenches for weeks, days, months, just getting shelled the whole time. It was incessant. It never let up. So it's not the fighting that stresses soldiers. It's the constant stress. And yeah. you might see that with certain workloads for certain healthcare professionals or social workers. It's just too incessant, and they're not having the breaks. Like, 
I'm quite a hard working person. You know, I work long days. I work. I might work ten hours a day, six days a week. But if you come in my bathroom, you'll see there's candles, there's the bubble bath, there's the rose petals. It's got got it all, mate. I love it. I love it because you've got to have that downtime. So it's about the rhythm, I would say. In terms of what to spot with people is when they lose that rhythm, when they're just doing all work. You know they're heading for a burnout. You know that. The other one is changes. A, a good one, I think, for British people is their sense of humour goes. So when that's a canary in the coal mine. Do you know what I mean by a canary? It's like an early warning signal. The coal miners used to keep these little can poor canaries, and they would die if there was a lethal gas. Right? They're like an early warning signal. So a good canary, I'd say, is cynicism. Uh, another one would be uh, loss of meaning uh, and the humour going. And the, the sort of generosity going, you know, when people have got their own well-being, they'll be generous to others. So they'll be they'll give five minutes to a colleague. They'll make a colleague a cup of tea. They'll drive a colleague home and go 10 minutes out of their way. You know, like when that generosity is going, that's normally people are getting to the point of exhaustion. And as I said, cynicism instead of like that humor can be there, but it becomes a cynical, dark sense of humor rather than a being able to laugh at things and just because humor is great and this is where the british people i think we do really well generally as the culture um the, the irish too and some other cultures as well but that ability to be able to step out of things and laugh at things and i think that's a very powerful tool yeah. you know it's not just about meditating i mean most of resilience if we think of resilience as group mental health or the ability to bounce back from stress is a social function so, you know, I've worked with soldiers and soldiers look after each other. Soldiers are tight, you know, soldiers are really like brotherhood and they actually have less mental health problems than, say, journalists because it's not the same camaraderie. Yeah. Right? Uh, humanitarians are a mixed bag. So it's like the camaraderie, the looking after each other, the group support is really critical. And that can't be carried just by the boss or just by the not the nice one, you know, that has to be a group function. So for me, you always need to look at mental health and well-being in, in the relationship to the to this sort of team if it's a work context mm -hmm. you know, or the family if it's a it's a family context so um you know that's 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 really definitely worth looking at but yeah there's some of the signs and symptoms obviously little health conditions would be another one people's stress goes down the, the, their you know immune systems go down with it um you can see in people's tone people's tone of voice people's muscle tone sometimes you see it in people's appearance you know, like we're obviously beautifully turned out today, aren't we both, you know, but sometimes when people start to go downhill a little bit, you know, they stop doing their hair or they stop doing their makeup or they, you know, come into work with a dirty shirt they wore yesterday and then you go, okay, they're not looking after themselves. It's pretty obvious. Yeah. Some really, really good advice there. And actually things I didn't think about that you just said as well, this idea of resilience and the fact that it's social. Now, this is something that, you know, social care could actually they could bring in quite easily. I mean, they have these staff that are very remote. So by kind of fostering these communications and helping to get that social aspect in, I think that's a good way to not only spot when something's wrong, if it's not you know, going as it has been going, but also a way to kind of keep people together, keep them, keep their com camaraderie up. And, you know, again, if, if other people are spotting it, it's not just the manager's job, it's, it's down to those care staff as well. You know, they can spot each other. Yeah, sometimes it just takes someone to go, you're right, mate. Do you want to yeah. have a chat? You know, sometimes someone just needs to unload. And I always say if someone, there's different ways to help people, right? And some people want one and not the other. So whether you're a boss or a colleague, we all want to help each other. Sometimes it's a joke. Sometimes it's not a joke. It's a listen. It's a good ear, you know, a bit of listening. Give someone a bit of good, good listening to, you know. Sometimes it's a practical help. It's like... You know what? I was stressed yesterday. The best thing you could have done is fix my uh, dripping tack in the bathroom. You know? <laughs> it's just a practical thing. Other yeah. other times it's a hug. You know, it's touch, right? Which may be limited supply right now. Other times it's a compliment. Other times I said it's a joke. Other times it's um, a referral. You know, like if I'm talking to a woman and she's stressed about something which maybe I can't really understand. You know, she's got something going on which I don't really have any experience or about childbirth or you know a cycle or whatever. I just might just give her the phone number of someone I recommend. So, you know, there's different things in different circumstances. And what we tend to find is some people get their favorite thing. You know, the classic is like men always trying to fix problems rather than, what was it? My friend, she was really stressed and she was actually upset because she's broken up with her boyfriend. And her dad came around and fixed the washing machine. <laughs> they came around and put some shelves up, you know. And he was just really trying to tell her that he loved her and, you know, it's going to be okay. But he didn't, he wasn't really able to do that emotionally. Yeah. So he was trying to show it practically. So, 
they call this love languages in romantic terminology, but it applies to care languages, basically, mm -hmm. is what they are. So it applies to colleagues as well. Yeah, I think, again, that's a really useful tip for care managers. Um, you know, it doesn't always have to be something emotional. You just have to pick up on those cues. Yeah. And it's to know your staff and understanding who your staff are. And again, you know, if you notice that they've lost their rhythm or you notice that, like you said, the sense of humor has gone or, or they're, they're starting to look different. It's not about, you know, pulling them up on that. It's about understanding what they might need. Perhaps they need, you know, one less shift. Perhaps they need one more shift if they're running out of money. You know, it's about knowing who they are to be able to spot those, those signs and symptoms, I suppose. Yeah, for sure. And really what you're looking for is a change from the norm. So you have to be paying attention to your people because then, you know, there's a baseline, you know, like it's like someone wears makeup all the time. You're not saying anyone should have to wear makeup, but if they stop wearing makeup, that might be a sign. Yeah. Right. Because you've noticed that. Whereas for someone else, that's just not how they roll. Yeah. You know, for them, it's going to be a, they might stop telling jokes. Right. So it's a different pattern. So I suppose the next question is really if. If someone, you know, is, is struggling with something, how should they best communicate that? You know, people might communicate in different ways or they might struggle to tell a boss or even sometimes a friend. So what should that person do if they're struggling themselves? Yeah, I don't think there's a, there's a single answer to that because, you know, it's about being human. Um, I would say let, let's look at these, these individually. Would your friend want you to tell them? Almost mm -hmm. certainly, yes would your boss want you to tell them now you might think no but i tell you as somebody who manages people i absolutely have to know the capacity of my team so a friend of mine a colleague of mine actually broke up with her boyfriend just before we did a training live the other week and i phoned her up and i sympathized with her but i also said how are you doing because i need to know if you can go live tomorrow or if i have to get someone else in to replace you and i need you to be honest with me Right. So I was I was compassionate, but I was also just asking very practically, we're about to go live for 200 people. I need to know if you can handle this. So a boss absolutely needs to know your state just in terms of your well-being as much as anything. Practically, you don't have to tell them all the details or bare your soul. But, uh, you know, and I, I would say with these things, it's um, we're not kids. Right. So we do take responsibility for our own well-being. Yeah. So, I'd say the two ways you could go with this that would be a mistake, there's a healthy balance between these two. So one mistake would be to become totally dependent, make all your problems, everybody else's problems, moan to everybody all the time. So you're a total whinger, total parasite, dragging them down, energy vampire, you know, constantly whining to your boss, taking up all his or her time, you know, like that's all becoming co codependent. So you're requiring your boss to look after you like you're a kid and they're a parent, right? On the other hand, you've got the person who doesn't tell anyone and then explodes and that's no good to anyone. You know, it doesn't let their own friends support them who'd be delighted to support them, you know, because people like to give. Do you know what I mean? If you've been a good friend to people, of course, they want to help you out back, you know. And it's, it's like it's like if you've got if you've got a friend and, and their mum or dad dies. Right. This is something I hope we all experience. Why do I hope that? Because the alternative is worse. The alternative is you dying before your parents, which isn't which is far worse. I've seen that. It's far worse. So at some point, we'll have a friend who's one of their parents died. You know, you could offer them different support, right? You can say, listen, do you want me to do some cooking for you? Because you might not be in the mood. Do you want me to just leave you alone? Right now, you've got loads of people around you. But I tell you what, I'll make a note in my diary and I'll just give you a call in a month and see if you want to go have a drink, you know? Like, there's different things you can do for people. And I think that that's, um, that's part of this is also allowing people to do those things for you right because that that takes a certain vulnerability and we're not i think particularly as british people we're not always great at that <laughs> definitely not um and i think from that what i just took is you know if you are someone who's struggling and you need to kind of put yourself in the shoes of someone who's going to help someone else like you would help someone so if you have a problem and you raise it to a friend you know even if that's just where it goes if it's just a friend you tell someone you would help them if they were in your shoes that's a really good frame. So when I'm working with a soldier with, say, PTSD and he's embarrassed to tell me about it because he feels ashamed, I say, well, if a friend of yours had these symptoms and couldn't sleep and was drinking too much, and you know, what would you tell him? You know, and then they tell me, well, I'd tell him not to be so silly. You've got to talk about your problems. I'd say, OK, you know, let's do that then. You know, or, or just to put that frame on yourself, mm -hmm. how would you look after yourself if you were a friend? Like if a friend lent you their car, you wouldn't smash it up, right? You wouldn't key it. Yeah, there's a lot of people key in their own life, do you know yeah. what I mean? Smashing up their own life. So if you just and I'm 
and for like sometimes you hear the Americans talk about like self love, you know, and that's a bit much for some British people. So I just go self politeness, you know, yeah. self civility. Just yeah. treat, don't mug yourself off. Just treat yourself with basic respect, like you would a friend. Not even a friend, like a stranger in the street that you didn't hate. If you can't manage that, you know, just just be polite to yourself. Be decent to yourself. Be civil, you know. Like yeah. most people are, are, like I'm, I always joke to my wife. I say I'm self exploited. I said, if any boss got me to try to get me to do what I do to myself, I'd tell them to get lost. <laughs> so I, I think that's an important thing is we treat ourselves like a friend and, and don't exploit ourselves. Yeah, no, really, really good advice there. I think if anyone who's listening has any examples of any times, you know, they have, they've helped their staff or been in any of that situation, they want to share it, please do do that in the chat. Again, this is meant to be collaborative and you guys can ask any questions or tell us anything. So definitely pop that into the chat box if you have anything to share on that topic. Cool. So the next kind of bit that I want to talk about is, so not just your top tips, so that's what's on the screen right now, there's a bit more to this. But as we said before, stress is a really, really big one right now during COVID-19. Now, we've spoken about some things that people can do about this and some, some sort of, you know, breathing exercises, have a stretch, they can tell people. <laughs> If you're feeling okay right now and you know you're not feeling stressed and you know as a care manager maybe your staff don't seem to be stressed what are the best ways to sort of maintain this equilibrium i suppose if you're feeling okay yeah i mean it's like any form of health right you, you don't start eating healthy when you've become chronically obese right it's like you don't wait until you have a heart attack to reduce your stress <laughs> like this is just built into your day so i would say it's it's maintaining mental health improving mental health thriving if you're doing okay don't wait till you got a problem which is a very human very normal thing to do but to, to treat it as part of your it's like washing right you don't have a shower once a year when you suddenly get a skin disease do you you just regularly wash right you, you know or when your wife divorces you you don't think oh maybe it's time for a shower it's just you've built it into your day. So I have a shower or bath once a day, right? If I swim in the sea in Brighton, I might not. You know, I might skip a day, but I'm not going to skip five days. Like, go to Glastonbury Festival, that would be about the maximum, wouldn't it? But um, I'd say the same thing with mental health. So you need to have a routine. And that might be, you know, 10 minutes meditating in the morning. It might be walking in the park on your lunch break every day. It might be yoga twice a week. It might be... Um, you know, you always get really good good sleep at the weekends if you can't get it in the week. You know, it might be a massage once a week. You know, so I have a pretty full-on schedule, but I've always built in. It's in my diary in yellow. I have a special color for it. Uh, different well-being things. I can share my screen and show you if you like. But it's, um, you know, like there's different things that are built into my day. So I had a Tai Chi lesson online this morning, did a little bit of meditation. Had a pretty full on day. I've got a, a couple of nice things planned for this evening. I've got a walk in the park plan while I'm on a coaching call after this and a couple of other bits and bobs planned. And, um, you know, it just means that it's part of my day and it sustains me. And if I'm going to work to get as much done as I want, people often ask me, they always say, Mark, how do you get so much done? You know, and I'm like, well, I rest really well. <laughs> you know, like that's basically yeah. the secret. So, um, yeah, I think you've got to build things in in terms of your own life but then then even better as part of your team you know if you're having a team meeting why not start that with three deep breaths or one minute of quiet one minute of silence before you start the meeting yeah put on a timer one minute yeah like just give everyone one minute to go oh, before the meeting starts yeah or at the end of the meeting appreciations do one round of appreciations in the meeting what do you appreciate about each person in the meeting I was going to ask you that and, you know, say it's it's great if, if everyone can kind of do this themselves, but, you know, as a manager or as someone who's managing people, how do we then keep that within our team? So we've, we've got that idea of, you know, just even just beginning of a meeting, three deep breaths. And then I love the idea of a round of appreciation. That is something that I think care managers and social care Huge. workers that spread out could easily do that. You know, they could even they could send it via WhatsApp. You know, it could be a Friday thing. Happy Friday, everyone. Send a round of gratitude. Don't end a meeting or end a week with people feeling underappreciated and miserable. You know, people leave jobs because they feel underappreciated by their managers and their colleagues, not because they don't like the job. Most people leave their jobs because of their managers and their colleagues. Yeah, primarily their managers, actually. <laughs> so that an appreciation is one that costs nothing. And it has to be sincere, right? You can't do it as a manager, as a technique, you know. John, you are great. Sarah, you are great. Yeah, it doesn't work. 
um, you know, it's actually about tuning in and going, well, you know, even people you don't like, there's probably something you respect or appreciate about them. So it doesn't have to be fake. Yeah, so building systems in and modeling. So they're the two important ones. So you build systems and structures because you'll forget. So you make it a norm that every meeting starts with three deep breaths or one minute of silence or ends with one minute of appreciations, you know. Every Friday you go for drinks or whatever. So you make it norm. You make the norms established and you model it. They're the two most important things. Super, super useful. And, again, these tips that we're sharing with you, they're not groundbreaking. They're not, you know... It's not something weird that you have to do in a team. You can go away and on Monday morning, you can start with these. You, know, you can start with your, with your health weekend and <laughs> get it going. Listen, the thing is, we all know this, right? We've all read the books. We've all heard the advice. You know, everything I'm saying, there's probably only 20% of it that's new to people. 80% of it they've probably heard before. That's fine. And the reason they've heard it before is because it works. You know, like I'm not going to tell you something that isn't going to work. And it's putting it into practice. That's... It's, it's, it's one thing hearing about it. It's another thing doing it. You know, you have to actually get up that 10 minutes earlier to meditate or you know, book that yoga class in. And there's, there's ways you can help with that. There's things you can do. You know, I like to book sessions with like my PT once a week now. She's allowed back out. You know, and I know she's going to be in the park waiting for me. So there's no getting out of it. You know I mean? so. No, definitely a good idea to build that in. And I think for our office teams as well. So the carers out in the field may have, you know, they've got a structured day, but they might not be looking at a calendar all day. But for your office teams, if you can build that into their day, you know, if you have a team meeting once a week and you build a couple of things in, just start small. You know, one thing next week, keep it going, make it a routine, then maybe you can add something else. Then maybe you can add something else. And if your team is seeing you doing those things, if your team is seeing you on a Thursday evening doing yoga, they're going to think, oh, okay, maybe that is worthwhile becomes normal real quick like let's take you do the centering exercise which is like a breathing mindfulness exercise mm -hmm. of every meeting for example you know what well, the first time you do it people raise an eyebrow and then the second time they'll remember that it was good last time and they won't mind and the third time they'll be telling you to do it yeah it's like hey mark maybe you should do that centering thing hey eh? you seem in a bad mood so it's, it's it's like pretty soon these things become culturally normal and you know you don't have to worry about it, it doesn't doesn't seem weird yeah i totally agree now let me just so no, if I, you have no. any questions please do pop them into the chat box because i would love it if uh yeah if we could. good any question is a good question any question is a good question <laughs> make it relevant like what do you really want support with or help with make it relevant to your your life your kids whatever you want <laughs> Got a little stretch, practice what I teach while, while we're waiting for the questions to come in. Yeah, we can have a little. Oh, <laughs> let's just stand up every half hour at least. You know, that's 43 minutes sitting down. That's a long time. Yeah. It's not good for you sitting down. <laughs> okay. No questions? Maybe everyone is just busy doing some mindfulness, some breathing and some stretching. And they're probably doing the washing up and they've got this going on in the background. That's yeah. normally what's going on, but that's all right. We're all busy. It's fine. I mean, we will be sending the uh, the recording of this webinar to everyone who signed up, so they'll have these tips and also a write up, so they've got those to to use. Um, but no, I suppose if there is no questions in that, it's very very quiet today. I think it's Friday afternoon. Everybody, everybody probably you know the sun's out. People probably booked in for this. They thought that sounds yeah. useful, and then the sun was out. They thought, you know what, I'm going to go to the park instead. And then they'll watch the recordings later. So that's all right. That's fine. You know, it's, it's fair. You probably made the right move to go to the park, people who are watching this later on. I don't blame you. <laughs> so I'm looking out there longingly. And you've got a walk in the woods plan. So that'll be I'll, lovely. I'll walk in the park near my house. Yeah, I've got a coaching call. But what I do is I, this is an example of how I manage my stress, right, without taking any extra time. So I have coaching calls as part of my work. That's a normal thing that I do. But I say to all my clients, it's going to be audio, not video. And I'm going to be outside. I hope you're okay with that. So I get their agreement. And then I just go for a walk around walk around the park near my house. So I, I get my, you know, two, 3,000 steps in easily yeah. doing that. Get a bit of exercise. Get a bit of sun. Get a bit of fresh air. Get out of my stuffy office. And I still do my coaching call. So it doesn't, um, doesn't cover any time. You know, I haven't yeah. taken an hour out of my day. I'm just incorporating it into my day. Yeah, I mean, I'm a strong advocate of that. I do that every single lunchtime. And I go and do my to-do list while I'm walking around the park. So right. 
I'll call my family while I'm walking around the park. Yeah, why not? Why not? I don't, one thing I would say is don't wear noise reduction headphones when you're doing it because I was I was like I couldn't hear my voice. I was just shouting on my calls, and then people at the park would keep looking at me. And I realised I was shouting. I didn't. <laughs> I had the noise reduction headphones on. I couldn't hear my own voice. So uh, that's that's the only the only bit of advice I would have on that. <laughs> Do you need to register to use COVID Club? No, just rock up. Just rock up. That's fine. We will share that link with you. Um, it's covidcalm.org, isn't it? Uh, Sounds right. Yeah. And there's a few sessions a day now, and they're different mm -hmm. time zones and things. You don't have to register. You just drop in, and, uh, yeah, you can rock up, even though they'll probably say, you know, for healthcare professionals, but you can still um, you can still join in, you know, if, you, if you've got a different job, whatever, that's fine. And, um, yeah, there it is. Uh, okay, so I recommend you go and check that out. Like I said, I, I did tune in and found it extremely useful, even though I'm not a healthcare professional. Even just watching the test session, there are a lot of things that I can use in, in my office life, you know. There's got some videos as well, there as well, the free videos of some of the techniques that if you want to practice some of those, and you can find them on YouTube and wherever as well. Okay. Oh. Should we leave it there? Looks like people have. Uh, unless you've got any questions, I'm quite. I'm happy to answer any of your questions as well. I don't think I have. I've asked you all of my questions. I think you've really, really helped me kind of, you know, put this into perspective. I was on board with a lot of the techniques anyway, but now we've spoken them through and sort of, you know, put them against some real life examples. I think that was really useful for me, and I hope it was really useful for everyone who joined us. Um, so no, oh, it's very professional, wasn't it, everyone? Very professional. Yeah. Nice layup, nice professionally done. You set it all up nicely. So good, you've got a good setup here. And I, I think the um, even though we did it very casually, actually that information we got across in the first 30, 40 minutes is quite vital for anyone who's got a stressful mm -hmm. job or anyone who's working as a care worker or anything like that. It's pretty vital information. So um, yeah, I hope we got that across in a fairly relaxed way for people on a Friday afternoon. And I will send the, the follow up email to you guys with the link to the COVID calm, uh, the drop in sessions. Also, just a summary of everything we went through. And uh, if you use any of the techniques, I would love to hear how they went. <laughs> you can tweet us at, uh, well, tweet us, follow us on Facebook, let us know. However you want, I'd love to know. And if you are a current birdie agency, I'm sure your account manager would love to know too. So definitely let us know about those. <laughs> cool. Well, cool. Nice one. all that's left is, yeah, just say thank you, Mark, for joining us today. That was really, really, really useful. Um, and yeah, have a lovely rest of the evening. Everyone else, enjoy your weekend. Um, and again, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you everyone. Nice comments as well. Appreciate it. That was that was that was chill. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.